Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Leon Hartwell. I am a Sotero Fellow at LSE Ideas. Welcome to another Russia-Ukraine Dialogue. Today, we'll focus on the impact of this conflict on NATO and European defense and security. In March, less than a month after Putin's February escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, the EU adopted the strategic compass. It's been hailed as an ambitious plan for strengthening the EU's security and defense policy by 2030. This month, NATO's, NATO member states will be meeting in Madrid. Their task is to adopt a new NATO strategic concept, the second most important policy document for the alliance following the Washington Treaty. On average, NATO strategic concept is only adopted every decade. It lays out the process of adoption that NATO has to undergo in recent years. And more importantly, it articulates a forward-looking vision informed by anticipated future threats. In the past, major developments and events have informed the shape of NATO's strategic concept. This time, undoubtedly, Putin's February escalation will be at the heart of the discussion. To help make sense of these developments, we have a very distinguished panel. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Admiral James Fogo, the current Dean for the Center for Maritime, Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. Admiral Fogo has had a prosperous career in the U.S. Navy, and he last served as Commander of U.S. Naval Forces Europe Africa and as Commander of Allied Joint Force Commander, Command Naples. In 2018, he led NATO's Exercise Trident Juncture, an Article 5 collective defense scenario that brought together some 50,000 participants from, from 31 nations. Secondly, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Elena Lazaro, Acting Head of the External Policies Unit of the European Parliamentary Research Service. She received a PhD in International Relations from the University of Cambridge, and Elena has held a variety of impressive research positions, including, I believe, at the London School of Economics. So welcome. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to welcome Lawrence Baranza, the Director of the Transatlantic Defense and Security Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, D.C. She's a self-described NATO nerd, and Lauren has conducted extensive work with the U.S. government, NATO ally, and partner governments to inform transatlantic security policy. Most recently, she was co-organizer of NATO's Youth Summit on Securing Our Shared Future. Welcome, Lauren. Now, Jamie, I would first like to turn to you, if you could unmute for me, please. What is the importance of the upcoming NATO summit in Madrid? What can we expect to be the central elements of the strategic concept? And how will those differ from previous strategic concepts? Thank you. Leon, thank you. And good morning from Washington, DC. And good afternoon to the folks on the other side of the Atlantic. It's really great to be here with you today at your invitation and uh, the invitation of the London School of Economics, especially alongside my colleague, Lawrence Baranza from the Center for European Policy Analysis, where I'm delighted to be a fellow, and also Dr. Elena Lazarou. Uh, so I'm thrilled to join you from the Center for Maritime Strategy, as you said, right here in Washington, DC. It's a great partnership with uh, LSE and to talk about the future of NATO. Uh, great question, by the way. Uh, the last summit where we actually came up with a strategic concept was 2010. Uh, in Lisbon. And I was there with Jim Stavridis, and there's one interesting quirk I'll talk about here in a minute. But in just a few weeks, uh, the Madrid summit will be upon us, and NATO will adopt its next strategic concept with the goal of defining security challenges for the alliance and outlining how NATO is going to address these challenges. And there are many, and many more than we expected a year ago. The strategic concept ties together the political and military means by which the alliance will address these threats on the horizon. And it serves as a critical roadmap. Uh, we frankly probably don't do them often enough. I mean, a decade is too long. But I do believe that the strategic concept will carry uh, added meaning for defining uh, NATO's values in light of Russia's recent aggression in Ukraine and the very likely ascent of uh, Finland and Sweden uh, objections from Turkey notwithstanding to full NATO membership, and I would welcome them on board. I actually think of them as already a member of the Alliance from all my time with them in 2015 and 16 in Baltops, and then again in Trident Juncture in 18. So I think the last three months of this war uh, is not gonna change the central elements of the strategic concept, but it provides 
kind of a greater sense of political urgency for member states. We've got to get things done and we need to do them quickly so that we can get this uh, conflict secured and move on. Uh, we saw in the last strategic concept in 2020 and 2010 in Lisbon uh, that NATO faced some um, different kinds of threats. It was before the Arab Spring. Uh, like I said, I was there in Lisbon with Jim Stavridis and the other individual that was there, completely unrelated to NATO, it was kind of on the eve of NATO's departure, was Muammar Gaddafi. He set up his uh, tent in the resort where NATO was conducting this thing, which was, you know, miles outside of Lisbon. And how ironic was that? We didn't see him as a threat. But yet one year later, as a one star in Naples, Italy, we went from humanitarian operations to combat operations in Libya. And although the military uh, portion of the uh, event, the operation, nine months long, went pretty well, phase four reconstruction was a failure. And that led to uh, Jens Stoltenberg and the North Atlantic Council conceiving of the NATO strategic direction uh, south hub for Africa and the Middle East. And I was pleased to bring that to full operational uh, uh, capability while I was in Naples. And they're doing good work, a little bit set back from COVID. But sitting from where I am today, I would say that the NATO charter is even more important than ever. It's not just a to-do list. You know, this is serious business. We've got people dying on the ground in Ukraine, war crimes being committed, uh, reinforcement of that uh, eastern flank. And that wouldn't have happened without some practice. And let me tell you, 2018 Trident Juncture was the event where we tested for real. We went in the field and we moved 50,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines and 10,000 tanks, 70 uh, ships and 265 aircraft as a practice run for the NRF. And this is the first time we've deployed the NRF. And I'm really proud of what NATO has done, especially getting the BJTF, about 5,000 troops, into the east immediately. So Madrid and uh, the strategic concept is going to need to focus on navigating political obstacles to strengthening the transatlantic bond, continuing to invest in critical capabilities. And Lauren and I have worked on a study on emerging disruptive technologies with SIPA. And uh, I'm telling you, standardization and interoperability are going to be key. Uh, they're going to have to define NATO's role with regards to China. China knew that this conflict was coming in Ukraine. China has not condemned Russia. China is sitting on the fence, and that's a bad position for China. And NATO needs to be part of the solution in convincing China that needs to come around uh, to the norm, standards, institutions, and, and behavior that we accept as Western nations, and China should too. And lastly, we've got to find new ways to engage partners who are vulnerable uh, to adversarial aggression. And by that, I mean not just Ukraine, but also Georgia and Moldova. So these objectives reflect the evolution of how NATO relates to its peers, its allies, and its partners. And I think it places a greater significance on addressing the China challenge and uh, allowing the alliance to focus on its core mission to ensure cooperative and collective security for its member states. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. I look forward to the uh, rest of the dialogue and the rest of the questions here today. Thank you, Jamie. I think that's a really great introduction uh, that leads us into our discussion. Before we expand more on NATO, let's turn to Elena first um, to talk a little bit about the European compass because this process happened, uh, you know, subsequently with while NATO was also ironing out the strategic concept. Now, what are the central tenets of the European compass and how much did the Russia-Ukraine conflict loom in shaping the discussion while it was being ironed out? Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon, for that question. And thank you for having me on the seminar today. Um, a great pleasure to have just listened to Admiral Fogo and to be on this uh, call with uh, Lauren as well, who's done so much on the NATO front and whose work I follow. Um, on the EU strategic compass, I think, you know, you already outlined two elements that are, I think, important to keep in mind. One is that this is a process that's been going on for a couple of years, and I'll talk more about this, but also in tandem with NATO's evolution towards a new strategic concept. So it's a, it's a process that has been, contrary to some, some media speculation, quite coordinated, I would say, with the NATO, NATO's own evolution. And of course, that, you know, right before its presentation, so right before March 2022, which was always supposed to be the presentation date of the strategic concept, we had, of course, this very disruptive event for geopolitics, uh, Russia's invasion 
um, Ukraine, and obviously that's played a part in the the form um, and urgency of the final text. But let me let me go back for a second to to sort of tease out the main elements that I think was the the main gist of your question. So the strategic compass is actually a document similar to perhaps a white book on defense, but quite dif different in the sense that we have a very unique formulation, in which is the EU. And so we have 27 EU member states engaging in this process of coming up with a joint roadmap, if you want, of where the EU security and defense policy will go. Now that's coming on the back of, I would say, a lot of pressure, uh, uh, natural pressure, uh, since uh, as of 2013, we've seen a number of developments on the EU defense policy front. We've seen um, the global strategy in 2016, and from there, three, I would say, separate sort of lines of work developing through various initiatives. One was to boost the EU's operational capacity through various forms. Uh, the second one was to invest more in the EU's defense technological industrial base and it's in it, the capacity of member states to both develop, but also coordinate on the procurement of capabilities. And then third line of work. So we had operational, we had industrial and capability. And the third one was EU-NATO relations. And we'd seen already in 2016 and 2018, two EU-NATO joint declarations. And these were largely guiding a lot that has been happening on the EU security and defense policy front since roughly 2013. So it's almost a decade with various initiatives. We had in, in 2020, essentially, uh, the voting in of the fir first time ever um, defense budget uh, allocation from the EU. It's not really a defense budget, but it's a defense fund, which is there to provide seed money for collaborative defense um, procurement, uh, development and research projects. So there's been a lot of movement on the EU security and defense policy front and the compass was meant to um, guide all of this, streamline it into in a way that would provide both, as I said, a roadmap, but also an action plan for the EU to uh, reach its, its, its level of ambition in the security and defense policy uh, by 2030, more or less. The process began uh, in 2020 with a joint threat assessment among the 27 EU member states, their intelligence services getting together and providing a sh shared assessment of the threat environment. That was the first time this happened. So on the e in EU language, it's an unprecedented event to, because one of the big uh, challenges to an EU security and defense policy has been the varied threat assessments of different EU member states. This was followed by a strategic dialogue among the 27 EU member states coordinated by the External Action Service to produce this final document that was endorsed by the leaders uh, in March, which is the strategic compass. And in the compass, essentially, the EU member states outline their plans, their action plans, uh, which are both legislative but also financial in terms of boosting uh, boosting spending and investment on four different fronts. The first is the EU's capacity to act, so really how to enhance and flexibilize and make um, uh, sort of adapt to the current environment the EU's missions and operations, both civilian and military, but also how to go about a long-standing challenge, which is the EU's ability to deploy rapidly some kind of force. And there we have the proposal proposal for the EU rapid deployment capacity that has got a lot of traction, you know, a 5,000 troop modular force that could be deployed for various types of operations, including evacuation, something that was an assessment that came out of Afghanistan. So that's the operational acting uh, group of actions that is in the compass. The second group of actions has to do with investing. And there we have a number of actions that are foreseen to help support, um, as I said, the European defense technological industrial base. So to give incentives through the European Commission to the EU member states to procure from the EU defense industry, but also to give the EU defense industry incentives to collaborate across EU member state borders. Then we have the sort of group of actions that is called secure, but which really has to do with resilience. And there we have a lot of civil, civil military synergy dimensions. So for example, how to boost the EU's actions in cyber defense, how to boost the EU space and defense uh, space policy links to defense, there is there a proposal for an EU uh, 
space and defense uh, strategy, which will come out next year, an EU cyber defense policy, which will bring together all these actions, but also it links up to other things the EU can do, uh, for example, in the domain of resilient supply chains and uh, resilient infrastructure. So really what we refer to as resilience both in the EU and the NATO space. And that's really a space where the EU and NATO do a lot together and aim to do a lot together, including through military mobility. And then finally, there is a group of actions that is the name partnership, a partner or how to partner with, has to do with partnering with, with allies and, 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 and um, like-minded actors around the world, both organizations like the UN and the OSCE and obviously NATO maybe the most prominent among them, but also countries like the US, the UK, democracies, uh, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, which is a sort of area of focus. So these are really the, 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 the actions and I'm happy to talk about them in detail uh, in, in the conversation we'll have afterwards. But perhaps one thing, because you did ask about the impact of, of Russia's war on Ukraine, and, and, and this is, of course, something that happened right at the end of the process, but was severely reworked into the document. Uh, and I think a few of the, the sort of implications of that have been, of course, the way that the that the compass introduces the urgency for the EU to do more on defense and security. Obviously, that feeds directly into the urgency of spending, uh, how the need to spend more to boost defense budgets. Um, it's also subconsciously, I think, mobilized uh, the, the activation of the European Peace Facility, which is also mentioned in the Compass and is the mechanism through which the EU member states are providing bilaterally weapons to, to support the Ukrainians. Uh, and obviously, you know, Russia featuring in the Compass as, as a key element of destabilization, not only in Ukraine, but also the mentions to Moldova, to Georgia, to the need to bring these countries into partnership. So I'll end here. Sorry if I went over my six minutes, uh, but uh, it was kind of, it's a long document. Thank you so much, uh, Elena. And for all that background, also, I, I think you've covered a variety of issues that we will um, circle back to. Before we do that, let's turn to Lauren Speranza. Lauren, so glad to have you here. Uh, and, um, you know, pleasure to always hear from you. Uh, Alongside the strategic concept, NATO leaders will also endorse the other vectors of the NATO 2030 package. Now, you've been involved with NATO in a variety of capacities and you've observed, uh, observed these processes quite closely. Can you tell us more uh, about the NATO 2030 package and how has the NATO 2030 agenda shifted since the February escalation? Thank you, Lauren. Super, Leon, thank you so much for having me. And it's such a pleasure to be here with uh, such distinguished friends and colleagues. Uh, really, really glad. A little bit of background on the NATO 2030 agenda, which you asked about. This was basically an effort to make sure that NATO remained ready and strong and united for a new era of increased global competition. It was born out of uh, this forward-looking reflection process, which began at the London Leaders Meeting back in 2019. And you might recall at that point, uh, quite different from today, You know, we were actually having debates about whether NATO was brain dead or obsolete uh, in some circles. And now uh, that is certainly not the case anymore, but I think that is in part you know, part of this arc of evolution through the NATO 2030 process. So as part of that, the Secretary General had a bunch of consultations uh, with allies. He received uh, input from an independent group of experts, uh, which the Vice Chair of SIPA's board kind of co-chaired for the U.S. Um, he engaged with civil society, with young people, with parliamentarians, with the business community to help shape the NATO 2030 agenda and position NATO for the decade to come. And then out of that came a series of policy proposals, um, which were actually endorsed at the June 14th summit back in 2021. And those pillars of the NATO 2030 agenda were wide ranging. Um, they started with kind of basic things like deepening political consultation and coordination, which was really designed to strengthen allied cohesion at a time when it was very much needed. Um, it talked about strengthening defense and deterrence, which was basically following through on a process that started back in 2014 after Russia's invasion of Crimea. There was a pillar focused on improving resilience, uh, which Elena just spoke to. There's a pillar on bolstering technological uh, supremacy, bolstering our, our technological edge. There was a pillar on upholding the rules-based order and the values that underpin NATO, 
there was talk about uh, boosting training and capacity building, which gets to a lot of the issues on the southern flank, which Admiral Fogo mentioned. There was a pillar on combating climate change, one on investing in NATO, both in terms of, of money, but also in terms of human capital and infrastructure so that we can deliver on the 2030 agenda. And then finally, uh, the last pillar was about preparing the next strategic concept, which uh, as we've mentioned, will be officially adopted at the Madrid summit next month. Now to your question, of course, Russia's unprovoked and illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine in February, 2022 changed a lot of things. It introduced a new geostrategic reality for NATO. Um, and I agree with Admiral Fogo's assessment that, you know, I don't think this changes uh, the fundamental core pillars of the strategic concept, but I would point to maybe four ways that this has, uh, this these events have altered uh, some of the thinking uh, going into the 2030 agenda and the strategic concept. Um, so first, I would say the war has forced NATO to have a larger focus on conventional defense and deterrence. You know, anecdotally, when you spoke to European policymakers a few months ago, there was a growing sentiment that the security agenda was really future focused and in large part about tech and cyber and space and digital issues. Uh, there was kind of a sense that future warfare is going to take place entirely online and in the information space. And, uh, you know, we won't see uh, tanks on a battlefield so much anymore. And alas, here we are with uh, conventional war happening in the heart of Europe. So compared to what may have been a kind of more aspirational strategic concept, I think there is a certain degree that we've been pulled back to kind of conventional issues of the here and now, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I, I just think it is a slightly different uh, undercurrent than we would have seen had the invasion not happened. Now, at the same time, Ukrainians are experimenting uh, with emerging technologies in this war, um, for instance, with their use of drones, uh, with some of their incredible victories in the information space and in cyberspace. So that underscores that we can't actually afford to lose focus on some of these tech and futuristic issues that we have to do both because that's what modern warfare today is all about. Um, I also think it's worth mentioning, you know, now there is some debate going on about whether Russia actually poses much of a lethal conventional threat to NATO, given its military failures in Ukraine, and that, you know, a war with NATO right now is the last thing that Russia would want at this stage. So why does NATO have to do anything at all in this vein? But my take is that, you know, Russia still does have a, a time distance gap uh, you know, advantage in the immediate region over NATO. Um, and as Putin becomes more desperate and more isolated, you know, now is not the time for us to rest on our laurels as the alliance. As Admiral Fogel underlined, you know, we've seen that you can't just create interoperability or military mobility or readiness overnight. That takes time to train. Um, you also can't just produce weapon systems overnight. Uh, that takes time as well. And there are supply chain and logistical issues. So uh, if anything, the war has shown us we need to prepare more now for security challenges in the future. Last three things I would highlight. So second, I think the, the war has uh, now produced what I think will be stronger language on Russia in the strategic concept. As you all know, as uh, the previous strategic concept sort of framed Russia as on track to be a strategic partner, now it is very clearly an adversary. Um, and even those allies who have traditionally favored a kind of softer approach to Russia have been pushed to take a stand um, against its, its unprovoked and illegal invasion. Um, this has shown us that we can't afford to have economic relationships with Russia without taking on the security vulnerabilities that come with it. So I think that will be a sea change in the framing of the threat environment that we see in the strategic concept, which is normally the first thing that the concept does. Third, I think the war has produced a greater focus on values that will be reflected uh, in the concept. Um, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has underscored that we are indeed in a fundamental struggle of autocracies versus democracies. This is a battle for shared principles and the, the rules-based order that NATO was in many ways created to defend. Uh, we see challenges to these values on both sides of the alliance, uh, you know, inside and outside. And so I suspect we could see some kind of renewal to, to those values um, in the concept. And then fourth, I think a very practical point, which Admiral Fogel also alluded to, is that I think uh, one way that the war has changed thinking behind the, the concept is that the strategies put forth 
maybe won't last as long as they typically do. You know, because the environment we live in today is so volatile due to Russia's actions, it's possible that we will need to update NATO strategic concept more often. Uh, as you mentioned, Leon, past strategic concepts usually last a decade, but I'm not sure uh, that this will, will stand that long. I know actually in the run-up to this process and throughout NATO 2030, there was some discussion in the US that maybe we should consider postponing the release of the strategic concept because of the invasion, but I don't think there was very much appetite at NATO for that. So here we are, we're, we're doing it. We've spent the last few months kind of updating and reworking pieces of the concept, you know, those that are drafting it inside NATO, but we, we may still need to reassess it in a few years time. Um, there's also still the possibility of updating NATO's guidance through other tools like political guidance or summit decisions and communiques. Uh, after all, we managed to use the 2010 strategic concept well past 2014 by doing that. So that's an option too, but those are just uh, some of the maybe more nuanced ways that I think some of the thinking has changed behind the concept since February. Thank you for sharing all of that with us, uh, Lauren. Um, I think there is agreement among the panelists that the strategic concept, concept is quite important. Uh, I'm wondering though, at, at a practical level, um, how much uh, the strategic concept uh, impacts on the militaries of NATO member states in terms of preparing and, and doing exercises and, and all those uh, kind of issues. So um, I would like to ask um, you, Admiral Fogo, um, how you think this strategic concept uh, will, will, will impact on, 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 on these issues, especially, um, you know, I, I realize I'm asking this question to someone who's, who's led uh, exercise, tried a juncture, you know, so, and, and, I'm, and I was wondering how much you thought about that the, the, the existing strategic concept at that time or whether you actually looked at it as you were preparing for that exercise. Thank you. Yeah, Leon, thank you very much. Great question and uh, great comments by uh, my two colleagues uh, uh, prior to this. But uh, I'll say the strategic concept allows the members of the Alliance to come together and prioritize uh, the plan. And once the 2022 concept is adopted in late June, uh, it's gonna set into motion um, processes and procedures for NATO militaries to ensure that uh, they can address key threats in all domains. Now, domains, that's an interesting, uh, you know, thing, definition. Land, sea, air, and since the last NATO uh, summit, Lisbon, uh, we have embraced cyber and space. Uh, you mentioned Trident Juncture. I launched another domain on my own, the sixth domain, logistics. It's uh, the Achilles heel of any joint force. And NATO responded with a pretty good study on military mobility, and that was led by Lauren and her colleagues and Ben Hodges at SEPA. But it needs to be embraced as a domain, and I don't see that in the strategic concept. You can't get anywhere without logistics. We uh, lifted seven brigades, uh, seven effective brigades in 30 days. So in order to do that, and you've seen all the, you know, Berlin airlift of uh, lethal and non-lethal aid going in nine to 10 flights a day into places like uh, Poland and other Eastern uh, European countries. So that's uh, an issue that's gotta be addressed. Uh, militaries will, will work together and adapt to existing strategies and ensure interoperability with uh, new member states and other member states. But remember, there is no standard tank and no standard frigate, and no standard weapon system. They're all different. And uh, in this sense, the strategic concept provides the militaries with a kind of a common assessment and how to work together uh, and provide feasible solutions with the weapon systems that they have, capitalizing on those niche capabilities. Like up in the Baltic, we depend on them to do mine countermeasures. That's an issue in the Black Sea right now, and it's gotta be addressed. Uh, it's not gonna be easy uh, to reach common assessment amongst all the allies. A lot of the members will face some political national caveats. We have those in everything. We had them in Libya in spades when we did that operation, both through AFRICOM and then transition to NATO under Jim Stavridis. And there are economic costs. We saw that in the last American administration with a push to get to 2%, a lot of nations responded and a lot of nations are gonna be encouraged to do that in the, in the uh, upcoming summit because of the threat from Russia uh, to help themselves. But it economically may not be feasible for some of the smaller uh, NATO allies uh, to do so. That's what collective defense is all about. I'm okay with that. I think you know when you're on board and you're providing in terms of troops or uh, land bases, sea bases, uh, air bases in your country uh, as a host nation, that that's a pretty good trade-off if you can't quite make 
two uh, percent, but everybody should try to get there. Last thing I'll tell you is the NATO Strategic Review 2030. Uh, I think it was November. It came out in uh, November of uh, 19. Came out in January of 20. That was a pretty good document. And Lauren and I have a colleague who's on the board at CEPA, Dr. Wes Mitchell, who I knew when he was at State. He used to talk to me quite often. Uh, he had a big part of the writing of that. And I think uh, I had some influence on that document when I always told him, you know, Wes, NATO needs a maritime strategy. I don't see one. You know, big nothing burger goose egg from NATO 2030 to present. I don't see it. And we have a crisis in the Black Sea right now with a Russian blockade. And we don't have any way of lifting that blockade. We don't have a plan. We don't have a strategy. We've got a lot of Navy out there. I think 22 of the 30 NATO members have Navy, some of them smaller than others. But I don't see a plan to resolve the issue of the blockade, not just the blockade of Ukraine, the blockade of the Danube, the Russians are on Snake Island. And oh, by the way, there's a bunch of mines floating around there. And I don't think it was the Ukrainians that sowed those mines or anybody else. Certainly wasn't a NATO ally that did it. And so those have got to be addressed. We have significant assets and standing NATO maritime groups and standing NATO mine counter countermeasures maritime groups. So we need to get back in there. And if we can't do that, we've got to come up with another solution. And maybe the EU can help us out. I saw a question online about, hey, what about this dichotomy between NATO and the EU? Uh, I'll give you this in a bold statement. <clears throat> you know, I'm a Francophone. I grew up, I was educated in, uh, in France at uh, Sciences Po. And uh, Lauren mentioned the comment by the French president on NATO being brain dead. Uh, it's not, obviously, and uh, NATO has recovered a lot of its reputation and its uh, uh, ability to respond to a crisis like this. But I don't see that strategic autonomy at the EU is going to be able to field any kind of a joint force to do what NATO just did in the eastern flank. So we ought to uh, spend our time figuring out how to be complementary and not competitive between these two organizations. So perhaps through non-aligned members or through something like uh, Operation Atalanta, we can get back in the Black Sea and solve this issue of the blockade of Ukrainian ports. And I think you're going to talk about that later on, so I'll reserve some additional commentary for later. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jeremy, and, and also for uh, bringing up this, this issue, the missing link being a maritime strategy, which, which is actually so obvious, but I think uh, this war, uh, it, the Russia-Ukraine war, has also highlighted how important we need to, uh, uh, to uh, attention we need to pay to this issue. Um, before we do that, let's maybe go back to this this question uh, online. John Newman asked a question about coordination. I think it's the perfect uh, question to ask to Eleanor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this many times before, but. Um, Basically, the rise of Donald Trump and, and his questioning of NATO spurred the discussion in Europe about quote unquote strategic autonomy. So, consequently, it, it raised concerns about compatibility between the EU and NATO defense and security. How much overlap do you expect there to be with regard to the EU strategic compass and NATO strategic concept? And will this be a matter of competition or complementarity? Thank you. Thanks for that question, Leon, and I think it fits very well with the, the comments that Admiral Fogel was just making. I, I really, I think in some ways uh, Russia's uh, war on Ukraine has been the last stone in a series of, of events that have uh, led very far away from the Trump era in terms of perceiving NATO and EU as a sort of... Um, competing organizations and what they're trying to do. Uh, I think the election of Joe Biden, the, the immediate support, well, first of all, during the Trump era, I think we had two phenomena. We had President Trump for a second showcasing some doubt about the, the, the NATO's purpose and that in reaction creating a lot of reaction in the Europe about you know the, the transatlantic bond. And I think now both the United States president being committed to NATO has reinforced as well in Europe the sense that EU defense will be developed uh, hand in hand with NATO since the US is also reinstating its commitment to European security. And I think under the current circumstances, we've seen more than ever that uh, that the U.S. remains committed to, to European security, albeit a United States which is also looking to the Indo-Pacific, which has been a long-standing sort of 
issue uh, or, or, or sort of concern uh, for which parts of the strategic autonomy debate have been raised. Um, I think at the moment we have a few things that suggest that EU NATO the course of the EU post compass and NATO after it adopts its strategic next strategic concept will go hand in hand. Uh, I, part of that is because the demands placed on both organizations are very, very large. So there is space for both to carry out tasks at which they are very um, adept and, 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 and sort of experienced and have the capabilities to carry out and whether that is operations, whether that is forward presence, whether that is cyber security, uh, there's, there's a lot to do. Um, we also have in terms of numbers with the application of uh, Finland and Sweden to join NATO, now we have even more members um, of that are members of states that will be members of both organizations. And it's important to say that Finland and Sweden have been some of the key supporters of the EU security and defense initiatives, partially because they were um, not NATO members, albeit they were very, very, very reliable NATO partners. So I think we have increasingly the sense that these organizations are converging both in membership, but also in, in goals. And that, that to me speaks to, to the, the intention to carry out tasks in coordination. Here in Brussels, we have uh, even increasingly more participation of representatives of one organization in the high level meetings of the other. Um, Secretary General Stoltenberg is often speaking to the Foreign Affairs Council, even to the European Council itself and vice versa. Um, so there is there is coordination and then projects like military mobility, uh, obviously, uh, and Lauren and Admiral Fogo and Sipa in general have worked very much on this, but I think they they showcase the, the sort of uh, necessity for the EU to work together with NATO because the issue of logistics and trans military transport, which is a crucial issue as we've seen now and in, in, in when, when, when push comes to shove, really uh, is a, an area in which the EU through the streamlining of customs issues, the digitalization of of, uh, of, of customs and, and, and uh, of customs issues, which is going on now in, in the context of military mobility, the EU really has a mandate to act in this area and really can facilitate a lot of this passage of, um, uh, of military equipment and personnel through European space, which is at the moment, of course, the space that we're looking at. Um, and perhaps to end at something that Lauren said, which I think is really important, is that the current situation is is really a wake up call to the fact that the future of warfare is also is, is a combination of the future and the past in the sense that conventional warfare is also here and but the emerging and disruptive tech which creates another type of warfare is also here uh, so really what's required is an organization that is uh, that has in place the mechanisms to carry out conventional uh, defense and deterrence even, but also an organization that has the sort of legal capacity to, to invest in, in defense innovation and in technology and civil military technology issues. So these are two organizations that do exactly that. So I think there is ample space through the new, if there is a new EU-NATO joint declaration, which we are expecting this summer to have all these issues in more detail outlined in, in the plans to carry forward. Not forgetting, of course, also the maritime domain, which I think is going to be really crucial, not only in the context of what we're seeing now in the Baltic, uh, in the Baltics and the Black Sea, but also um, Operation Atalanta was mentioned. And I think it's really important not to forget that while all this is happening, of course, in the northern part of Europe, there is still the piracy issues near Africa. There is still the issue of the, the, the Gulf. Um, uh, there is still the issue of sort of uh, freedom of navigation in certain straits uh, in Asia and in Africa. So we'll need to have operations increasingly in those areas and, and both organizations are concerned with this and, and there's space to, to work more together. Thank you, Elena. I think those are great points. So on, on that issue, uh, Lauren, on, on how this war kind of reflects, you know, the future but also the past in, in, in many ways, you know, uh, that we have to strike this kind of delicate balance. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, how can NATO member states ensure that they don't look at the Russia-Ukraine tree, but the NATO defense and security forest? And what, in your opinion, are the central aspects that should make up that forest? Thank you, Lauren. 
Thanks, Leon. It, it's a good question about how to, to zoom out and, and see the full picture. Um, I think I would start by saying we as the Alliance don't have the luxury of choosing our threats uh, and that effective defense and deterrence today requires balancing a variety of both functional and regional challenges, uh, as Admiral Fogo said, across domains, but also across the spectrum of conflict. And this underscores the notion that the U.S. talks a lot about, which is integrated deterrence. And that's precisely about bringing together our tools across domains, across the spectrum of conflict, across our interagencies as governments, and and across allies and partners. And I think that is how NATO ought to be thinking about its responsibilities. Now, of course, resources are limited and NATO does have specific places where it can add value compared to other actors like the EU, which we've been discussing, and the UN, for example, um, specifically when it comes to conventional defense posture. Um, and that can help focus NATO's specific tasks. But I think this wider approach of, of thinking about integrated deterrence is helpful for the Alliance in terms of its approach to defense and security, the, the whole forest, as you say. Um, I think just to dive into a little bit of some of what the key aspects of that uh, approach ought to be. One key issue I think is balancing Russia and China. Uh, of course, Russia is the most pressing near-term challenge to European security, but China is the pacing threat. Um, I heard a great quote the other day that while Russia is a hurricane, China is climate change. Um, and so we have to address both uh, in their own way. And I think NATO plays a key role in combating China's efforts to challenge transatlantic security interests in cyberspace, in the Arctic, um, in the technological fields, through critical infrastructure manipulation, and kind of across the rules-based international system. And this brings us to another point, which is another key aspect for NATO to figure out, and that's how to address below threshold threats. So things like a massive cyber attack or a disinformation campaign, for example, which might not trigger the Article 5 collective defense clause, depending on the scale and, and whether we can attribute the attack but it would warrant some kind of response. And our answer here has often been for allies to build more resilience. So basically trying to reduce vulnerabilities and mitigate the desired impact of these attacks. But in my opinion, I think we also ought to be um, developing ways to disrupt these malign influence campaigns in our favor a bit more proactively. And then I guess one last point would be on technology, um, which is a critical aspect of NATO's deterrence posture, which we've we've mentioned. And Admiral Fogo um, mentioned the, the study that SIPA is doing exactly to this point. Um, NATO is doing a lot in this space, recognizing the role that emerging and disruptive technologies can play in preserving NATO's technological edge. It has, for example, launched uh, DIANA, which is the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. It stood up a new innovation fund, uh, which are all very positive and relatively quick steps for the alliance in this realm. But I think individual allies still have a lot more to do in terms of investing in the right capabilities for specific uses, uh, focusing not just on R&D, but also on adoption and procurement of these capabilities. Um, and then also fixing the regulatory environment, which often fails to allow us as governments and militaries to fully embrace the radical innovation that's happening in the private sector. We have to open up our, our defense industrial basis and really learn to put the collective alliance good over short-term national economic gains in individual allied countries. So I think, you know, that's not a comprehensive list of, of the forest, but I think those key uh, key challenges are things that NATO ought to be thinking about. The balance between Russia and China, figuring out the below threshold space, which has been very difficult for NATO as a traditional military alliance, and then figuring out how to effectively leverage tech. Thank you, Lauren. And I'm definitely going to be thinking about the hurricane versus climate change analogy quite a lot since you've mentioned it. Thank you. Um, Jamie, earlier you mentioned uh, the, the joint by the imminent, we should say, maybe joining of Sweden and Finland of the NATO alliance. Uh, so I'd like to ask you a question about that. One fundamental aspect of each strategic concept involves aligning complementary strategic, geographic, and resource considerations. How do you anticipate uh, the, the NATO membership of Finland and Sweden will impact on the strategic concept, especially with regards uh, to their potential contributions to <clears throat> Arctic security. 
Thank you. Yeah, Leon, uh, great question. Uh, let me just first uh, address three of the things that have come up online on chat. First from uh, Sergio Moreno. Uh, he asked the question, uh, it looks like UNAM, Mexico. Uh, so Sergio says, hey, is neutrality important in these kind of concept or conflicts? And should we respect, respect neutrality of nations? I think it's come up several times with Ukraine. And I think at one point, President Zelensky said, well, obviously, we're not going to become members of NATO. So he is for the interim discounted that. And I think that's just fine. He's doing a great job of defending himself. And uh, NATO allies and partners and the United States are providing a lot of support there. So that one probably goes on the shelf for now. And we'll figure it out later as far as Ukraine status. Uh, uh, Anthony Valiant, a uh, very interesting question about the return of the Trump administration. We all see what might transpire in the elections in November here, where uh, Republican right comes back in to take both houses, uh, House and the Senate. What does that mean for NATO? I think this conflict in Ukraine has sealed NATO's fate in a very positive way. Uh, anybody that comes into office and tries to disenfranchise NATO after what it's done and what the allies uh, have done with the United States, uh, would be that would be politically foolish. So I think this has helped secure the alliance in perpetuity. Uh, last question is, what from Derek West, what NATO country is likely to be invaded by Russia? Well, if you ask President Duda in Poland, he thinks his is. And if you ask uh, the leaders of the three Bs in the Baltics, they're very concerned about it. And the reason that Sweden and Finland are joining NATO is because I think they have a fear of coming across a border, 803 kilometer border in Finland, connected right with Mother Russia. It certainly took place during the Winter War in, the 19, in 1940. And then Sweden and Gotland Island are very concerned about that and Russian encroachment there. So there's a few for you, uh, Derek. Great question. On the issue of uh, Sweden and Finland coming on board. You know, back in the day when uh, the alliance opened up, the uh, Soviet Union fell apart, the Warsaw Pact disintegrated, and a lot of nations uh, sued for NATO membership. The United States and our, our partners uh, went in and conducted partnership for peace and evaluated and assessed uh, some of these nations. And I was certainly doing this with Jim Stavridis back in 2009. And what we found was a lot of the Eastern European countries were very heavy uh, tank, artillery, uh, heavy, old types of things. There were a lot of general officers per capita of enlisted personnel, way too many, too many chiefs and not enough Indians to fight the war. So there had to be reform. They had to get agile. They had to get uh, the ability to have lift. A lot of them didn't have any lift aircraft, so we created Papa Hungary with a consortium of C-17s to help out. They didn't have a lot of ISR, so we've got NATO AWACS to help out. A lot of nations have come on board there. So there was a reform process. You know what? I've worked with the Finns since 2003 when I first went to Santa Mina Island, their Special Operations Forces uh, training ground. That was when they came out with their new assault rifle, which is equally as robust as an AK-47 and make a marksman out of anybody. And I've watched them in, in 15 and 16 and, and 18 in Trident Juncture. Same with the Swedes. They don't need reform. They're already agile. They've already got the capabilities. The Swedes have got submarines, Visby class Corvettes, aircraft. I mean, uh, we just had uh, Ava Hook Haslam, who's the first CNO of the Swedish Navy here, and Dr. Steve Wills went over there to Stockholm. So these guys are ready to come on board. I'm, I'm convinced that there's not a lot that NATO has to do. This is a good deal for NATO, and it increases our ability to defend the rest of the alliance because now we have even more buffer. And remember, this is not a threat to Russia. We don't go grab Russian territory, you know, like they illegally annexed Crimea and now are attacking in Ukraine. Uh, we defend. Uh, the borders of the alliance. Now, as far as the Arctic is concerned, I'll tell you that uh, about a year ago, uh, in collaboration with Lauren, uh, Commander Rachel Gosnell and I, somebody that worked with me in Europe, is getting her PhD in Arctic studies, we put together an article for Europe's Edge, which is the online journal of SEPA, and it talked about the transatlantic or the transpolar bridge. So the Chinese say that they have a polar Silk Road. Our alternative was why don't we declare a transpolar bridge and say that the Arctic nations have control over policy. So Sweden and Finland coming on board, part of the, uh, um, of the Arctic uh, nations and the Arctic Council, which by the way, was uh, picked as a model for governance and even nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for keeping things calm in the Arctic. But what they don't like to admit in the Arctic Council is it's been militarized since it was discovered by Commodore Peary back in the early 1900s. I, I've deployed up there in submarines and you guys have seen pictures of me online on Sea Devil in 1985 at the North Pole. The Russians are up there too. They think it's their backyard and their lake. 
they have a certain right to all of the territorial waters and the exploration and oil that they're doing up there. But uh, the rest of it portends to the Arctic uh, Council nations and allows for innocent passage across the top. And China's realized that and it's an economic, uh, in their economic interest to do that. So in our article, to, to, to be as brief as possible, we came up with this plan that we said, hey, the Arctic Council is great. You also need to bring back the Arctic shots. Um, and that included Russia, uh, Gerasimov to sit down at the table. I don't know that he'll be there much longer if he's even uh, in power right now, if not just a figurehead because of what's happening in Ukraine. There were a lot of Scandinavian nations when we shopped this around uh, inside the beltway here that said, mm, not so fast. Okay, we're not going to empower the Arctic Chads Conference uh, with any kind of policy uh, or decision-making um, uh, capability. We will do that through NATO. That's what one of the Scandinavian, I'm not going to mention, ambassadors told me. And I said, well, what if you brought your minister of defense with you? Well, that might be acceptable. Would we prefer to talk about the Arctic through NATO? Voila, here you go. Now you've got Sweden and Finland on board in NATO. So those uh, decisions and that discussion can take place. But the missing link is still Russia. We've got to get back to the table. And as distasteful as that might be, it has to be done. And you got to deal with the issue of China. We talked a lot about China earlier. China is becoming more and more prevalent in the Arctic. And, you know, Lauren mentioned uh, new weapon systems from the study of emerging disruptive technologies. Hey, the Moskva was sunk by subsonic cruise missiles. It should have been able to defend against that. And the United States Navy and NATO Navy should be able to defend against that if they were attacked by two subsonic cruise missiles. Hypersonics is a game changer. And the Arctic may become the proving ground for testing of some of these new weapon systems like hypersonics or Putin's Poseidon torpedo, which he has uh, revealed in the last couple of years. But let me just stop there and say we welcome Sweden and Finland on board, and I hope they get uh, membership as quick as possible. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, I'm with you there on, on Sweden and Finland. Um, let's go to Elena. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question on uh, uh, with regards to Strategic Compass again. Based on your experience with what came out of the Strategic Compass, are there any major differences of opinion among European states with regards to what should be in uh, with, with what we can expect would also surface during the NATO Strategic Concept? How will how will that impact on what is? reflected on the strategic concept. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, let me just tie on to the, the previous comments by Admiral Fogo that I think uh, some of the, I wouldn't call them differences, but sort of cultural diversity when it comes to EU member states' defense culture are undergoing very interesting and important changes at the moment. And, and one of those changes is those states that have traditionally been neutral with regard to, to defense and security policy for different reasons, because I think for every EU member state that has been thought of as a neutral, there's a different history there and a different reason. But with Finland and Sweden, um, which by the way, have very, very capable militaries uh, applying for, for uh, joining NATO potentially, uh, with Denmark having tomorrow its referendum about uh, whether it will be full part of the common security and defense policy. Uh, we've seen the Austrians have a very interesting and heated debate about whether they should increase their defense spending and change their defense posture. So I think on some issues we are seeing uh, again, spurred by this war, some some sort of cultural convergence, if you want, with regard to both the fact that the EU should move forward uh, towards a more robust um, approach to its defense policy and a more clear strategic orientation, so the compass. So that, I think, is one thing that we see as a sort of converging among member states. I mean, the other thing that has always been brought up and which has obviously been a big challenge is the threat assessment. You know, the threat assessments differ among 27 member states with very different ge geographical positions and historical sort of roots of their um, national interests. And that was always something that, that the Compass 
was uh, aimed to surpass and the threat assessment that was carried out in late 2020 uh, brought about these differences and at the same time showed that on some key issues consensus did emerge so you know the perception of China which had previously been a more diverging issue among member states and there seems to be some convergence uh, on, on, on how to perceive China um, both as a rival but and a competitor but also as a partner on some issues such as climate issues. Um, perceptions of Russia had been an issue which had obviously for again historical and geographical reasons divided to a degree member states with regard to how big a threat Russia posed but I think that question is no longer there and we've seen member states that are traditionally more reluctant um, to to sort of have a hardline policy towards Russia you know the, the to not reverse their their positions, obviously with nuanced approaches depending on you know dependencies, economic dependencies, and other such issues. But we've seen some convergence there. Um, and at the same time, of course, there are states, member states in the EU, which have other perceptions of their key national threats, and those are not perhaps top in the uh, in the remaining member states. So I think the threat assessment is the most important place where one looks when they want to see, you know, what is it that, that will challenge 27 EU member states in having a collective and coherent and uni unified approach towards their security and defense policy, and then how that will feed in in those 21 or 23 that are NATO members through those in, in the NATO strategic concept. Uh, but again, I think, uh, well, there's two things now that are interesting, I think, is that the strategic compass following Russia's war, on following the 24th of um, February, the language was changed to make sure that the threat assessment will be repeated more frequently when needed, even every two years. And I think that process will, it's a socialization process, which will, I think, lead very much to, to increased convergence. Obviously, we're having all these European councils at the moment on Russia and in Ukraine, and these are also leading to, to discussions and understandings mutually of what the concerns are. So I think on that front, we have we have uh, some increase in convergence. And then, of course, there is the issue of solidarity and mutual defense, which underlines the degree to which those states, the member states can converge. So, so the assumption that um, the state in any kind of threat um, and specifically defined in the relevant treaty articles will be supported by the other member states by all their means when when if if they are if their territorial integrity is threatened and obviously there's article 5 so so i think the more we have a sense of mutual solidarity and defense the more we will see that the threat assessment will be easier to to sort of share but uh, i think i'll stop here but these are really the issues that i think is the most important moving forward also because defining the threat will also define the focus on the development of capabilities and strategy because there's different demands when your main threat is russia and different when it's china or or another type of threat so thank you Thank you, Elena. And, and I'm going to quickly jump to Lauren. I know you have a hard stop also at the hour. And, um, but I do want to ask you uh, this question since uh, it's been highlighted earlier by uh, some of you that this conflict has really kind of accentuated a, a values discussion that, that's also long overdue. Now, the Russian war is often presented as a battle between authoritarianism uh, and the free world. Uh, there are still major concerns within NATO about anti-liberal, anti-democratic behavior uh, uh, within the alliance. Now, should NATO be concerned and what are the options of dealing with those NATO member states? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Leon. It's a fundamental question. You're absolutely right that values are, are more important uh, now than ever. We are in this fundamental struggle um, you know, basically a battle for the free world and, and the values that NATO stands for. The, the war in Ukraine is a very real world manifestation of that. Um, we do have to compete to defend democracy and our rules-based order. And I, I'm a firm believer that what we do now will determine the future success and attractiveness of, of this system going forward. Um, as you said, we've been emphasizing these values a lot as, as allies, as NATO, but I think the Alliance has to do some more thinking about ways we can practically recommit to them. So some of the ideas that have been going around in the debate here in Washington um, 
One is that we could see a new pledge in the upcoming strategic concept. Uh, the reflection group, as part of the NATO 2030 process, put forth this idea of uh, a code of good conduct, essentially, that builds on the principles in the Washington Treaty, but then adds two new tenants uh, focused on good behavior. Um, another idea is that we could think about some ways to monitor allies adherence to these values. So some kind of reporting mechanism or annual assessment where you can basically have an open discussion about these issues within the alliance. So a kind of behind closed doors within the family uh, naming and shaming, if you will, um, to, to kind of push allies to abide by these rules. I think the most difficult thing, of course, is uh, how do we raise the costs uh, on allies who break the rules? There's a lot of concern about what this could do to allied cohesion, especially given NATO's consensus rule and the lack of legal mechanisms to sanction or expel members who violate NATO values and principles. Um, something that has been talked about is uh, potentially creating incentives and disincentives uh, through things like leadership positions for countries at NATO, uh, the placement of NATO facilities or ministerial or summit locations. Um, so, you know, using those as incentives for, for allies that, that respect the, the rules and values. Now, of course, this can also backfire in, in a case that an ally could take this as a kind of cold shoulder and, and become even more isolated and disruptive from within. Um, and that's that's a problem because all of the allies within NATO now, you know, we're better off having them firmly rooted inside the alliance than outside. And so that is, you know, the fine line that we walk when we talk about um, how to enforce this. I think the recommendation, uh, which again came from the, the reflection group report for a center of excellence for democratic resilience um, inside NATO to promote good standards and behavior rather than punish rule breakers is perhaps a good way to start. Uh, so I, I suspect perhaps we could see some kind of language uh, to that extent in the strategic concept. Thank you, Lauren. I know you have to go, so feel free to jump off um, with the with our other two panelists. If you would like to take another question or two, um, um, I, I definitely have uh, something to ask you. So just wave to me if you're if you're okay to for me to ask you another question. Let's see, Elena, do you have to jump off? And Jamie, can, can you yeah, both take more. another question? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with one more question. Okay. Well, let me ask you, uh, Jamie, since you've, since you've talked about the Black Sea earlier, uh, Russia's actions in the Black Sea are uh, contributing to massive food shortages and hunger. Can you talk to us about the effects of the Russian blockade? Uh, is there a NATO solution for it? And what options are there to break this blockade? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Leon. Uh, you know, so in the interest of time, I would offer uh, the last podcast that we did here at the Center for Maritime Strategy was uh, last Friday. And that was with uh, 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 Dr. Nick Lambert, who's the author of uh, The Warlords and the Gallipoli Disaster, and Dr. Ian Ralby of the IR Concilium, who's an econo economist and uh, international security scholar. So uh, these two gentlemen came in and we had a discussion about then and now. So the Gallipoli disaster 107 years ago, not a lot of people realize one of the centerpieces of that book is the Russia telegram that came from uh, uh, one of the Russian generals under the czar who said, if you don't do something about the Dardanelles being uh, shut off, Russian wheat will not get out. A lot of that wheat came from Ukraine in order to support the war effort with the United Kingdom and France, who were the allies, the Triple Entente against uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire in Turkey. Uh, the Brits made a bad decision. They went down there with their fleet. They tried to bombard the uh, naval artillery on the coast and they got sunk. And they were so incensed that they invaded Gallipoli and lost 125,000 men to the Turks, 250,000 Pyrrhic victory, both sides. So, you know, this conflict has the potential to, to get really ugly in the Black Sea. Russia is blockading Ukrainian ports. Uh, there are silos full of grain in Odessa that can't get out. This impacts a lot of countries. You're talking at least 40% of the world's wheat supply. Then when you add corn, barley, other grains, and sunflower seed and sunflower oil, which, by the way, is one of the prime ingredients in baby formula, and we got a real shortage in this country, which has become a crisis. You know, you're talking about 50% of uh, world grain supplies. So the countries that are going to be impacted 
and uh, potentially have a food problem on their hands, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt in a big way, the Sudan, we always see famine there. It's tragic. Venezuela in South America. Now South America is impacted. And Iran. Not that I shed a tear for Iran. I don't have anything against the Iranian people. But the problem is when there's unrest in Iran, it affects the rest of the Middle East. And in order to alleviate this world food crisis, the blockade has got to be lifted. Can you do that with NATO? Sure you can. We could go charging in there. The problem is you've got Russian kilo-class submarines and you've got a Russian surface fleet that's on guard after the sinking of the Moskva. And so a mistake or a miscalculation that takes place between a NATO warship and a Russian warship could lead to World War III. That's what the politicians and the policymakers are concerned about. I'm sure it'll be a subject of discussion in Madrid. In the podcast, we offer other solutions. Why not take some of the non-aligned nations, particularly those who are impacted by this, and particularly those who have navies like Egypt and send them in under a UN mandate. Now, of course, a UN Security Council resolution is going to be uh, vetoed by Russia unless Secretary General Guterres can get into Moscow again and make it in the Russians' interest to lift this blockade. So uh, I don't know what that is, but that's why we have diplomats and politicians and the United Nations. And other nations could accompany uh, the Egyptian flotilla to go in there and potentially reflag. There are other options uh, being discussed about putting a NATO operation or an EU operation in there and reflagging uh, grain carriers to get them out. Once again, uh, that is risky as a result of Article 5 if something happens between a NATO warship and a Russian warship. So let me just leave it there and back to uh, you and Elena for comment. Thank you for those insights. And, and feel free to drop a link to your podcast in the comments section uh, for our audience. Elena, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, you know, China came up earlier. One of the central uh, concerns raised during the NATO 2030 process is the observation that there is once again, following the end of the Cold War, a return to great power competition, which has once more become a central concern for NATO defense and security. And increasingly, uh, and, and this is fairly new in, in NATO communiques, there are increasingly references to China. Uh, you know, how do you think China will be presented, uh, to, you know, in, in this uh, uh, strategic concept? You know, will it be presented as a strategic competitor? Will we go further than that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think a lot has been said also by Lauren and Admiral Fogo. And if one looks at, for example, the 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 United States approach, because we're talking about strategic concepts, so it's NATO, yeah. uh, US, yeah. in there too. Uh, just to make sure you asked about the concept, um, yeah. in spite of in spite of the current situation with the war uh, on Ukraine, uh, if one looks at the Department of Defense uh, transmission to Congress about the next uh, US national defense strategy, if I'm not mistaken, China is still in the the threat number one. So I think looking to the other side of the Atlantic, we have no doubt what, what the US uh, will be looking at. Uh, and, and it's no secret that through the NATO 2030 process and everything that leading up the, is leading up to the new NATO strategic concept, China, it's, the, it's militarization, it's activity in the South and East China Sea, it's hybrid activities in Asia, including through its um, infrastructure support activities, its activities in, in, in Africa and in Latin America, they all merge together to make China a very important threat. Now, to the degree that this is NATO business, I think that there, you know, to the degree to which this has to do with what NATO considers its core tasks to be, um, I think that will be a big part of the strategic uh, concept. That's my understanding. And I think if one looks at the gradual um, I wouldn't call it a deterioration per se, but I would call the developments that have been characterizing EU-China relations, you know, the uh, the sort of um, freezing of the then to a year and a half, two years ago, proposed comprehensive agreement on investment because of China's human rights violations, the sanctions and counter sanctions between China and the EU, the way that China has now been reacting on, on Russia's uh, aggression towards uh, actually war on Ukraine. And uh, I think all of this will contribute to a general consensus across the alliance about China being 
uh, designated as a key threat to look to. At the same time, at least in, in, in the EU, if one looks at most of the relevant documents from the Commission, but also the way that China is being discussed, I think there is an understanding that on the mm, non-traditional trans-border threats and no, most notably on climate change, it's very hard to, to have a sort of global solution or reaction to this problem without China being on board. So I think the EU at least will keep looking to China as partner when it comes specifically to this climate change dialogue. Now, I don't think that will feature in the strategic concept of NATO, but I do think that this will continue to be the case when it comes to, to these uh, new um, global threats, uh, such, as, such as climate, which at the end of the day, and I think that's what I was thinking as Adam Fogo was, was speaking, it's all very connected also, because climate is a root cause also of food insecurity, and obviously the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine is aggravating this problem and it's kind of domino effect, which we've been working a lot on, uh, is the instability in the areas that Admiral Fogo has mentioned and also in Yemen and other countries that are really going to suffer as a result of this. And, uh, and that I think will feature in the strategic concept. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that also, uh, and, and also to Admiral Fogo because uh, Again, this, this war is, is important because it is so consequential, way beyond the borders of Ukraine, way beyond the borders of Russia. So um, I, I think there are a lot of issues that we will still unpack in the, in the coming months. So thank you uh, to all three of our panelists, Admiral Fogo, Dr. La Razo, and uh, Lauren Speranza for your incredible contributions to this discussion. I am really looking forward to inviting you back again to the LSE Ideas table uh, for some future discussions. And uh, to our audience, please join us next week for another Russia-Ukraine dialogue. We'll be focusing on how to negotiate with Putin uh, with an equally impressive panel. And thank you everyone again. Uh, Admiral Fogo uh, mentioned the name of the podcast uh, on, on uh, Russian hunger blockade. So. Uh, uh, he says you can find it by searching Maritime Nation podcast, which is available online. Thank you again to everyone. Uh, good luck and goodbye. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks to your listeners. Bye.